Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this introduction to Fedora Workshop. Um, probably have some other folks join us as we go along here, but uh, it's the top of the hour, so we should probably get started. Um, so let me just share my screen. Uh, OK, so. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, this is a workshop that uh, we've done large parts of uh, typically in a more, uh, in a live situation, um, but uh, uh, given the uh, current circumstances, we're um, trying to move a lot of our materials online. So um, this is just a, an introductory workshop, um, but afterwards we'll send out a survey. Uh, I'd be very interested to hear your feedback uh, on everything. Uh, particularly what uh, what worked and what didn't uh, to try to make the uh, experience as, uh, uh, as good as it can be. Um, so my name is David Wilcox and I'm the program leader for uh, Fedora here at Lyricis. Um, and uh, in terms of today's workshop, uh, I've got a few goals. I mean, largely this is just trying to um, make sure you can understand the capabilities of Fedora, what it can do for you, uh, and, and also just gain some hands-on experience. Um, and so ho hopefully all of you received an email from me with a link to uh, an online sandbox instance um, that you can use during the workshop. Um, if not, uh, you can follow along with the demo. This, this is being recorded, which we'll send out afterwards, and you can always go back and um, do the hands-on exercises uh, at, uh, at your leisure. Um, and, and I'll say as well uh, that there's a Q&A function, um, and, and I'll try to pause at various points throughout the workshop here today just to um, try to see if there are particular questions that uh, folks would uh, like me to answer um, and then we'll, we'll have some uh, some time at the end as well uh, and for those that don't know uh, fedora is stewarded by lyricis um, and we're a, a not-for-profit uh, really focused on enduring access to um, all of our shared academic scientific and, and cultural heritage and there are a number of divisions within lyricis uh, fedora is uh, within the duraspace community supported programs division uh, along with a number of other open source technologies you might be familiar with uh, dspace vivo uh, collection space and uh, and archive space i'm happy to answer questions about um, lyricis if, uh, if there are any but uh, i think i'll jump in here uh, and talk more specifically about fedora so i have a few slides just trying to set up some context and um, explain a little bit about what Fedora is and, and what it does. Um, and, and then about halfway through, we're going to jump into some of the uh, hands-on exercises, which I encourage you to um, try to follow along with. So at a high level, Fedora is open source repository software. Um, you can use it to store, preserve, and provide access to digital objects. Um, one of the main features of Fedora is its flexibility. So being able to model content really however you wish, um, using any kind of relationships uh, and whatever sort of complexity that you need, um, although it also supports very simple use cases as well. Uh, the way it achieves this is primarily through supporting uh, semantic relationships between objects, so using linked data and RDF to be able to uh, build out uh, different object models uh, just depending on your use cases. And I have a couple of examples that hopefully show how that works. Um, of course, Fedora is built to support millions of objects with no particular limits on uh, on file sizes. Um, and, and I think a, a really important part is, is that Fedora really is designed to interoperate with other applications and services, as we'll see uh, as we go along here. But um, it really is uh, very rarely used on its own, except in sort of uh, uh, dark archive type situations. So in terms of the, the value proposition, you know, why uh, folks tend to use Fedora, uh, again, as I said, the, the flexibility, I think, is one of the main uh, factors that uh, uh, drives uh, adoption of Fedora, this ability to handle simple use cases, but also complex use cases. Uh, often use cases start out fairly simple, but then they tend to grow over time. And Fedora is very agnostic about uh, what type of uh, metadata that you use. It doesn't have any particular restrictions, um, nor on the uh, uh, how you'd like to kind of organize your objects and uh, build out your repository. Um, uh, but I think increasingly as well, there is this uh, interest in durability uh, and digital preservation. And certainly that's the focus of the next uh, major version of Fedora, which uh, if we have time here at the end, I'm going to have a few slides 
uh, talking about kind of the roadmap. Um, this particular workshop is focused on the, the current uh, version of Fedora, which is version five, but um, version six is, is coming out um, later this year, and, uh, or at least in beta. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but this notion of durability is very important to Fedora. Um, it has a number of features that support long-term digital preservation. We'll, we'll get into those as, uh, as we go through the workshop. Um, I think it's also uh, uh, important to note that Fedora uh, is widely used around the world. There are several hundred instances of Fedora concentrated mostly in North America and Europe, but um, uh, elsewhere in the world as well. And, and so that's certainly a part of a decision uh, around uh, to use a piece of software, particularly open source software, is just making sure that it's widely adopted. And, and I think that's certainly true of Fedora. Um, but as well, Fedora is really based on standards, and, and this is quite important just around uh, being able to get data into the repository, but also out of the repository in very standardized ways. So you're not sort of locked in the way you might be in, in proprietary applications that sort of maintain your data in, in particular ways and, and sometimes make it difficult to uh, get data out of the repository the way you would like it. Um, and, you know, as, as, as you'll see, as we start talking through some of the ways that Fedora is designed, uh, we really focused on standards um, in the design of the application and, and of the API and all, all of those interactions. Um, and finally, and I, I think one of the most important reasons why people would adopt an application like Fedora really is the community. We, we tend to think of it not just as open source software, but as community supported open source software. Uh, and and it, there really wouldn't be a Fedora uh, without the community, whether it's all the institutions that uh, fund us on an annual basis through membership that, that help us employ full-time staff like myself and uh, our two tech leads, uh, Andrew Woods and, and Danny Bernstein, um, or, or just all the contributions that we get from community members at the, uh, that uh, contribute their time from their institutions to uh, build and, and maintain the software over time. Um, and it's an important factor in adopting Fedora as well, because this, this community means that if you're at an institution that doesn't have a large developer team and doesn't have a lot of institutional support for, you know, uh, repository applications, uh, that you can rely on the community in terms of uh, using the mailing list or using Slack or uh, the other communication channels that we have to be able to ask questions and, and get feedback and get answers that um, can, can help you um, with, your, with your repository. I think it's important to note as well that, you know, fundamentally Fedora is a, a middleware application. Um, it does have a user interface, but it's largely for administrative tasks. Um, most people are not using the sort of built-in interface as a, a kind of public facing Fedora interface. Um, and you can certainly build your own interface, your own sort of workflows on, on top of Fedora, uh, which is why it's attractive to uh, institutions that have very uh, specific needs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the API and how that works. Um, but there are also a number of community supported uh, projects out there that provide uh, not just a front end, but a whole framework around Fedora. And uh, the two most popular of those are, are Samvera and Islandora. And if you're sort of um, looking at Fedora as an option and haven't decided to uh, adopt it yet, I'd certainly encourage you to take a look at uh, both of these um, uh, both of these uh, frameworks, because um, I think they have a lot to offer in terms of um, uh, bootstrapping uh, 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 an organization that's trying to adopt Fedora, so you don't have to write a bunch of um, custom code yourself. And these are quite well-established um, projects that have a lot of um, really good features. Um, and just related to that, I thought I would provide um, a few examples. I, I just grabbed uh, some screenshots of some public repositories that I know are out in the world that are based on Fedora and I included some URLs here um, in case, again, you're sort of um, kind of shopping around a little bit and want to see some examples of um, what a Fedora-based repository might uh, look like in the wild. Um, and there are a bunch of different use cases that are supported here. So um, this is just an example of an uh, institutional repository use case. So uh, theses, dissertations, and that sort of thing, which is uh, quite a common use case. And, and this is a, a Samvera-based uh, repository. Um, and uh, the, the URL is uh, uh, in there, there on the slide if you, if you want to take a, a closer look at, um, at repositories like this. Um, research data is another fairly common use case, and, and this is from the University of Michigan, uh, the Deep Blue Data Repository that um, is also a Samvera based application. Um, so it has some similar uh, interface elements, um, but uh, uh, using Fedora in the, in the, uh, in the back end. Uh, newspapers are quite common as well. And this is an example of a, a public uh, newspaper repository out of the University of Maryland. Uh, this one actually is a, a custom interface. So just showing that, um, you know, there are a, a variety of different interfaces that you can use 
um, uh, on top of Fedora, uh, and and this of course is leveraging um, things like uh, high resolution uh, image viewers and uh, and some nice uh, searching capabilities. Um, Islandora recently launched version eight, which is built on um, the latest version of Fedora um, that's released so far, version five, and this is just a, a recently released uh, public um, site out of New Zealand uh, that's based on the latest version of Islandora that kind of just supports a variety of special collections. Um, and, uh, and again, just kind of demonstrating lots of different interfaces here, lots of different use cases. And the common denominator really is just at the back end, uh, Fedora is being used for um, storage and, uh, uh, and preservation. So I'll talk here a little bit about some of the fundamental concepts. Uh, and, and again, do feel free to uh, jump in with, uh, with Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll try to get those as we go, but also uh, at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I try to address whatever uh, questions pop up in, uh, in the Q&A as we go along. So within Fedora, uh, and this is just trying to describe how things are represented and, and stored in the repository. Um, essentially, everything in the repository is a, it's a resource and specifically uh, a web resource, just meaning that it has a, an identifier or a URI. Um, and, and all of these resources are one of two types. You, there are container resources, which are typically used to uh, describe something so they, they contain all the metadata um, about, uh, about a particular thing. Uh, and then uh, binary resources, which are basically just files. So, um, you know, if you upload a, a PDF or a video file or a, an image file or anything like that, that gets stored in, in Fedora as a, as a binary. And really everything in the repository, the collections, the, the objects, uh, uh, everything is, is a resource and everything is either a, a container or, or a binary file. Um, and these resources can also have uh, properties and these are expressed as RDF triples. So this gets a little bit into linked data, which we're not gonna touch on too much today, but um, RDF triples are just um, linked data uh, elements that are used to uh, describe resources. And, and this could be descriptive metadata, it could be administrative metadata, security metadata, uh, what have you. Um, you can also uh, store just a uh, binary XML metadata if, uh, if that's what you're using. So um, you're not required to use linked data, uh, or you can use a mix as well. You can have um, some properties that are uh, RDF properties and linked data, but you can also just upload and store kind of binary uh, metadata formats if that's, uh, if that's what you're using. So uh, Fedora is pretty flexible in that way. It's not gonna require you to um, only use one or the other. Um, and finally, just noting that um, you can have this sort of uh, tree of containment where uh, if you have a container, those containers can um, uh, contain other containers, so an apparent child type relationship, uh, and they can also contain binary files. So when you're modeling out your resources, and I have an example here, um, you can do that in a, uh, in a variety of, uh, of different ways. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to just grab the, um, some of the questions here as, as we go. So there is a, a question asking, uh, does this mean Fedora is a, is a triple store? Um, and it, it, the answer is no, uh, although it's a little bit more complicated than that. So Fedora does store triples, um, but it's not itself a triple store in the sense that a triple store really has a very specific meaning in that um, it, it's queryable. Uh, it has a, a search endpoint that uses uh, Sparkle as a, as a query language. Uh, and Fedora does not have a Sparkle search endpoint for, for querying. So when you put triples in Fedora, it does store them. Um, but uh, as we'll see later in this presentation, you can also just hook up an external triple store and there's an indexing mechanism there. And the idea would be that Fedora stores those triples, but then you also index them in an external triple store, and then you can query them uh, based on that. So Fedora is really a repository, it's for storage. Um, in a previous version of Fedora, there was a built-in triple store, and that just became really problematic because uh, as that triple store started to become out of date and, and uh, unsupported, it was, it was uh, really difficult to uh, use something else instead. So we just try to separate things and make Fedora store all of these things, but there's lots of really good triple stores out there. Um, and it's very easy to just index all of your content from Fedora uh, to that external triple store and then be able to um, search based on that. Okay. Um, and, and so this is just, uh, I've got a couple of slides here just trying to demonstrate um, how things can look in Fedora. And again, you can, you can model um, content really however you wish. Um, but, but this is just an example, you know, let's say you had 
um, a, a book. Um, and here I'm trying to, uh, in the lower left corner, you can see there's um, two shapes here. The, the kind of cylinders are, are containers and the, the flatter kind of square things are, are rectangular things are, are, are binary files. So if you were to create a book in Fedora, you could model it something like this, where you create a book collection, which is itself a container and it has descriptive metadata about it. Um, and then you could create some containers to represent the books themselves. Uh, and they're sort of children of the book collection. Uh, they might have their own descriptive metadata describing the book. Uh, and then you could further subdivide that into pages. So you could create individual container resources for the page, because maybe you have page level metadata that you want to represent. Uh, and then at some point, you may have binary files that are uh, kind of children of, uh, of these pages um, that represent sort of, uh, say, digitized scans of of the pages. Maybe you have high resolution TIFF in images and, and lower resolution um, JPEGs for thumbnails and uh, and those sorts of things. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, th that's one way that you could sort of structure uh, a, a book within Fedora. You could do it sort of in that hierarchical way. And, and this really is just meant to kind of paint almost the same picture, but just demonstrating that since Fedora really fundamentally organizes things using RDF, whatever, however you actually structure your resources in the repository, you can always build whatever relationships between those resources that you want. So even if you don't actually store things initially as a kind of hierarchy, you can always add relationships to build out a, a book or whatever your resource is, however you want. Um, and this is pretty powerful. It, it means that you can uh, organize things however you want. You could have pages that belong to more than one book, books that, that belong to more than one collection, uh, et cetera. Um, it, without having to sort of uh, copy and paste things all over the place. You can just use these RDF relationships to kind of build out your content however you wish. Um, and there's a lot more we could say about that. We could do a whole workshop on uh, sort of linked data concepts and, and how they apply in Fedora. Uh, and if there's interest um, uh, in uh, uh, diving into that a little bit more, um, one of the things that we're going to put out in the survey is, is sort of a uh, some suggested topics for future trainings. And this is a slight aside, I guess, but um, uh, we'd like to take advantage of this sort of doing things online and maybe uh, breaking up some of the trainings we normally do into sort of smaller modules, and maybe more focused modules. So we're going to suggest some topics, but also leave room for you to suggest topics. And um, in any case, I, I would encourage you to fill out that survey when we, we send it probably later this week um, with uh, uh, just to get your thoughts on other types of training that would be useful. Uh, and this is just a screenshot. We'll be looking at this uh, live later in the workshop of um, what the actual uh, properties look like uh, in a, uh, on a resource. And uh, these are the just uh, representations of the RDF triples that are um, describing a, a resource in Fedora. But um, we're going to look in that in a little more detail when we, when we do the hands-on stuff. And just related to standards, I have a link here to the API specification. Again, we could do a whole workshop on this, but uh, a lot of the way that uh, users interact with Fedora is through the API. Uh, and that API has been documented and specified, uh, which is quite useful for anyone who wants to build custom applications on top of Fedora, because um, it just details in, in uh, a, a lot of specificity what standards Fedora uses, how it implements those standards, how you can build on top of that. Um, and we've really tried to do this so that we don't have as many customizations to maintain. You know, everything we do, we try to align with a, a broad community standard rather than doing something in a custom Fedora way. And it also lets us participate in some of these related communities that are doing similar things with web standards and, and, and things like that. Uh, and there's a link and I'll, I'll send out um, these slides. Uh, and actually, it, let me just put in a link for everyone too. Um, you can follow along, especially with the hands-on section um, with, uh, with the slides. Uh, and I'm just in the chat for everyone going to put a link to the slides in case you'd like to do that. Uh, just take me one moment here. It's just a set of Google slides. So uh, that's in the chat now. Um, if you would like to, uh, to follow along, you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, it'll be useful, again, for the, for the hands-on stuff if, uh, uh, if, you, if you'd like to have that up. So I'll talk a little bit here about some of the core features and, and we're going to fairly quickly move into doing some of the hands-on stuff um, following this. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll go through these. This is just kind of the high level presentation of what are the features of Fedora, but I'm, I'm gonna go through these in, in more detail and, and we're gonna do some hands-on work with at least a couple of these. We didn't have time, uh, we won't have time to do hands-on for all of them, but we'll do hands-on for some of them. Um, so really Fedora has five primary features and uh, I think this is kind of an important slide if you're wondering sort of in brief, what does Fedora do? I, I think this does a pretty good job of, of describing it. And we'll, we'll break these down, but you know, fundamentally Fedora really does kind of five things. Um, you know, it does this, you know, your basic resource management stuff, creating, reading, updating, and deleting content. And I should say here, the way this is laid out is, is in, in bold on the left is, is the particular uh, feature and in the sort of uh, more gray text on the right, uh, these are just standards that we're aligning with. Um, so in the case of all the create, read, update, delete stuff, um, that's all done in alignment with this standard called the linked data platform, um, which again, I, I won't go into detail uh, in this workshop, but it is its own independent standard and, and you can look that up um, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that. But um, similarly with uh, versioning, being able to uh, create versions every time you make changes um, uh, in the repository and, and there we're using a, a standard called Memento. Um, authorization is just kind of security, so being able to set up policies for what users and groups can interact with uh, various resources in the repository, and um, that's all done using a standard called Web Access Control. Uh, Fixity is, is just uh, being able to monitor files for uh, to ensure they don't get corrupted or changed over time, uh, and we we use some uh, headers for uh, being able to calculate uh, Fixity and report back on it and make sure that um, everything is uh, is the way it should be. Uh, and messaging, which I'll talk, and I'm going to talk about all these in more detail, but um, uh, messaging is just a, a, a sort of a pattern where when you make changes within the repository, um, it, it mis emits messages and those messages can be used to kick off external workflows and, and activity streams is just the standard we're using for that. So uh, that's just a snapshot. I'm going to go through these in, in a little bit more detail for, for each one of them, but um, just at a high level, those are the the features that Fedora provides. And this kind of gets back to the interoperability uh, point that I was making earlier. Uh, Fedora is very intentionally tightly scoped. Uh, we really don't want it to do very many things. We just want it to do uh, a small set of things well uh, and in accordance with standards. Um, of course, every repository will have many, many more use cases than these features will cover. Um, but that's why uh, we rely on uh, frameworks like uh, Islandora or Sambera, external tools like external triple stores, which I mentioned, uh, and, and lots of other things. And, and you know, we're, we're just trying to provide uh, well-documented patterns for integration um, and, and have Fedora sort of play a, a limited role in that ecosystem. Um, and so again, with, with the, the create, read, update, delete, um, this is really just a kind of standard-based uh, pattern for creating and managing resources. Uh, but it's also how you model content in Fedora. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do here now is actually switch over to my other browser window so I can actually do some of the hands-on stuff. Uh, so give me just one moment here and I'll flip over. Okay, um, so you should be able to see now uh, my other browser window where I have these slides in just kind of the uh, uh, editing mode. Um, and I have, uh, in another tab, I have my, um, my actual uh, uh, sandbox uh, instance. So um, here, uh, here's where we can uh, try to do some of the hands-on stuff uh, as a group. And I'll, I'll try to go along here fairly slowly. Uh, if you do get behind, um, don't worry, we are recording this. So you'll be able to go back and, uh, and try later um, if, it, if it's not working out for you. Um, but I'll try to demonstrate everything uh, as, as we're going. So, so now would be a good time uh, to open a browser tab and just navigate to the sandbox uh, instance um, that you uh, received in the email. Uh, and you can just kind of click through to the, um, to the rest uh, endpoint. Uh, so you'll probably start out uh, on this page and, and you can just click the, the rest endpoint button to uh, go to the main. Uh, the top level of your repository, and I, I just created a test here earlier to make sure everything was working. Um, but I'll flip back to my slides here. And we can start to go through some of this stuff. Um, 
So uh, we're going to do some hands-on, uh, and there are, we're going to be using this HTML interface, which is what I was just showing. Um, this is really just a kind of dynamically generated interface that sits on top of the REST API um, and lets us do most of the stuff that you can do with the REST API, but, but not everything. Most people that are interacting with Fedora on a kind of development level would likely be doing it through uh, some kind of a more comprehensive client. So if you're familiar with um, you know, command line operations, uh, curl is, is pretty popular. And there are lots of client libraries that you can use. But um, to keep this as simple as possible, we're going to kind of just focus on the HTML interface because it's nice and easy to use, uh, especially for uh, folks that uh, uh, might not be uh, super technical. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier. So, uh, and this is just the credentials for the sandbox. Uh, I, I included them in the email as well. But um, everyone's going to have a different IP address here. So yours is going to look different than mine. Um, but everything should work. Uh, and this slide here, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on. This is really what, I, what I've tried to do through these slides, and this is why it's nice to kind of have them in front of you. Um, and and I recommend probably um, maybe you know subdividing your screen a little bit so you have your web browser on one side and maybe the the zoom uh, on the other. How, however you'd like to organize it. And and actually that's a point that we'll ask in the survey in terms of uh, what works and what doesn't. Um, trying to do hands-on stuff while you also have a Zoom window open and also have slides open is probably going to be a little bit challenging. Um, but if anyone has uh, either good or bad experiences there, it'd be help, helpful to, to hear those so we can uh, learn from this and, and do better next time. Um, but in any case, this is really just more for folks that are developers or, or pretty comfortable on, on the command line and want to know how the different elements of this HTML interface map on to um, operations that are common in APIs like post and patch and delete. Um, we won't spend much time on that here. This is really just kind of to, to make it easier to, to uh, understand how that works. And I've also linked to the documentation for the API itself because we're just going to be going through some of those operations. Um, and, and on each of these slides, uh, you can largely ignore this uh, text box with the curl stuff. Uh, really, that's just there again, and particularly afterwards for uh, those of you that are developers or, or just comfortable in the command line. It's just the exact same operation that we're doing in the HTML interface, but represented as a, as a command line command. So you can largely ignore those uh, for the purposes of this workshop. Uh, it's really just there. So you can go back afterwards uh, and, uh, and understand uh, how uh, the operations at the interface level map onto uh, what you would be doing if you were doing this on the command line. Um, so um, maybe I'll just, before I create anything, just do a, a quick overview here of, of the interface itself. So, so again, this is just kind of an HTML uh, view of the repository. Uh, this here at the top just kind of tells you where you are in the repository at kind of the top level, and it'll change as you, as you navigate through. Um, there are a set of properties that you can expand and Fedora provides just kind of some default system properties like when this resource was last modified, what it contains, etc. cetera. Uh, but you can always add to those. Uh, and if you were adding descriptive metadata, that's, that's where it would appear. Uh, over here, you can use these uh, buttons to create resources. So you can create uh, different types of uh, containers and we're only gonna be using basic containers today. There are information from the direct and indirect containers are defined in the link data platform standard, but we won't go into them in detail today. Uh, we're just gonna be using basic containers and binaries. You can provide an identifier or let Fedora generate an identifier for you. Uh, you can provide some initial RDF, but we're just gonna leave that blank for, for our operations today. Uh, and then on any given resource, you can also update the properties. Uh, and this is using a uh, syntax, um, a, a query language called Sparkle Update, um, which is used to kind of create and modify RDF. Uh, so we'll, we'll touch on that very briefly, um, but that's uh, really just being able to update the, the sort of metadata properties on a resource. So we're gonna do some really simple operations here. Um, if you're at just sort of the top level, the slash FC repo slash rest URL of your uh, uh, sandbox, um, we're just going to create a basic container, which is the default, uh, and I'm just going to call it uh, image-collection. You can type that in or you can copy-paste, whatever you prefer. Um, if you have the slides in front of you, you're, you're welcome to copy-paste them down on slide 24. Um, so here I've got basic container selected as my type, and for the identifier, I'm just going to call this image-collection. 
So if you just put that in, in the identifier, either copy it or, um, or just type it in. Um, and then you can either hit the enter button or you can hit the add button um, down here. So if I hit the add button, you'll see the, the URL at the top of the page changes to represent where you are in the repository. And there's even a little breadcrumb trail so you can very easily get back to the top level. Uh, and so we've just created a new uh, resource, a new container resource uh, called image collection. Uh, we haven't added any metadata, so it just has these default properties of when it was created and modified, et cetera. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's about it. That's just sort of a basic container resource uh, that doesn't have any particular metadata associated with it. So going down to slide 25, um, we're going to just create um, a, an additional container. So creating kind of just a small hierarchy within the repository. Um, so as it says here, you're, you're redirected to this image collection resource that you just created. Uh, and then we're going to create another basic container uh, within the image collection container. So just setting up a little hierarchy. Um, and, and this one we're going to call uh, Andromeda Galaxy. So you can, again, copy paste or, or just type it in. And I'm going to click over here. So I'm at this image collection resource. Um, and I'm going to create another basic container within it and I'm gonna give it an identifier of Andromeda Galaxy. And so this is fairly simplistic, but you could imagine we're just kind of creating a very basic image collection here. We've created a container for the collection and then we're creating a container for an image uh, that we're calling Andromeda Galaxy. And I'll hit add here. Uh, and so it just becomes part of this breadcrumb trail. You can click up or down this to, to sort of navigate the hierarchy that we're, we're creating. Um, and now we have this uh, uh, Andromeda Galaxy uh, resource in the repository. So I've got a slide 26 here, and it really this is just kind of describing what's going on in terms of, you know, it's doing a get operation to retrieve that resource and show it to you, um, and just kind of describing how that works. So the, these slides in, in part are meant to be referential. You can always go back and afterwards, um, they have some details on them that uh, uh, might be useful. So uh, the next thing we're going to do on, on 27 is, is upload an image. Um, you can really upload whatever image you want here, but if you don't have an image handy, um, you can just download this uh, uh, image from, uh, uh, from NASA if you, if you go there and, and you can save it as um, andromeda.jpg somewhere on your local computer. But uh, for purposes of this exercise, feel free to use whatever image you have um, laying around. Fedora is not actually going to display it. It's just going to store it. So I've already downloaded this, um, but feel free to, to download it locally. And then on slide number 28, here we're going to create a binary resource. So we've created a couple of containers and now we're gonna create a binary. So those are the two main types of resources that you can create uh, in Fedora. So I'm gonna stay on this Andromeda Galaxy container that I just created uh, and I'm gonna create a binary. So I'll use the drop down menu to choose binary. Uh, and I'm going to give it an identifier of uh, Andromeda.jpg. And again, if you didn't enter anything in this identifier field, Fedora would just assign you an identifier with a bunch of random letters and numbers. Um, and often that's what people will be doing in production, uh, or you may have your own identifier scheme, uh, and you can plug that in and have Fedora do that. Um, but for demo purposes, it's just a lot easier to have legible uh, uh, identifiers so we can just navigate the repository more easily. So I'm at this Andromeda Galaxy container, uh, and I'm going to use this menu to change from basic container to binary. Uh, you can see as soon as you do that, you get a little file upload dialog um, or button. Uh, and for the identifier, I'm just going to call this one Andromeda.jpg, uh, and then I'm going to browse for that resource. Uh, so you'll have to go to wherever you stored that uh, locally. I'm going to navigate to it here in my uh, browser. So I'm going to grab Andromeda.jpg and then hit the add button. So it should just take a moment as it uh, uploads the file and actually it happened fairly quick on, on my end. Um, and when that happens, again, it's going to take you to that resource itself, but the page is going to look slightly different because it's a binary resource rather than a container resource. So it has um, a bunch of different properties. Uh, so it captures the file name and the 
uh, the MIME type um, and uh, a few other uh, properties here that are more related to files than containers like the, uh, the uh, checksum uh, for fixity. Uh, it also has a button here to download. If you click that, it'll let you download it locally. Uh, it has a fixity button too, and we'll, we'll uh, take a look at that a little bit later when we talk about fixity. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, it has a lot of the same uh, kind of interface as a, uh, as a container resource. Again, on, on slide number 29, it's just kind of describing um, uh, in a little bit more detail what you're seeing there. Um, and on slide 30, this is where we're going to uh, do a little bit of uh, metadata addition. So we've done a, a create operation and we've done a read operation just by looking at those resources. Uh, so now we're going to do an, an update operation. Um, and here I'm going to go uh, back up one resource. So I'm going to use the, the breadcrumb trail here. Uh, and I, I can see I've got andromeda.jpg. And then if I click the resource, directly before that uh, to Andromeda Galaxy. I'll just go up one in the hierarchy to the uh, container that I had created. And you can see here, it'll show you the children, uh, which is this Andromeda JPEG. So you can use that breadcrumb trail to kind of navigate up and down whatever hierarchy you, you happen to have uh, created in the repository. And so here, I'm just gonna add a really uh, a simple, uh, DC title property. I'm just going to add a DC title of Andromeda Galaxy. Probably the easiest way to do this is just to copy and paste, but if you want, you can manually type this in uh, to the box and I'll, I'll show you where you can do that. But I, I typically just do um, copy these three lines out of the slides. But um, yeah, feel free to uh, to type in manually if you want. There's just more opportunity for um, error if you, if you do it that way. But if I go down to this update properties box on Andromeda Galaxy, um, there's all these prefixes in here. This is really just some template um, stuff for you. Uh, when you're adding metadata properties, uh, you have to kind of specify what metadata schema you're using. And so this is just populated with a lot of po uh, common metadata schemas. So you don't have to go find those um, uh, out, you know, out on the internet and, and, and put them in, in the box here. So DC is already defined, so we don't need to define it again. Um, and this delete insert where is again, just a template for you. So with uh, Sparkle Update, we, we're gonna use the insert part. Um, I'm just gonna uh, paste over these three, but it, it should look something like that even if you if you type it in manually. Um, and all, all that's going on here is, is we're just uh, doing an insert. This basically represents the form of an RDF triple, the sort of open and closed caret um, uh, type bracket is, is uh, just indicating uh, the subject is this particular resource that I'm interacting with right now. Uh, the predicate is is Dublin Core uh, title, and the, and the object of the triple is is Andromeda Galaxy. And and again, if you're not super familiar with linked data, we could do a whole workshop on that. But um, this is really just inserting a very simple uh, title property to this resource. And if you hit the update button, uh, assuming you did that correctly, uh, you should see a, a DC title here on the uh, on the properties for that resource. Um, and you know, that's just a really simple addition, but um, you can write uh, much more complicated queries, uh, you know, adding multiple properties, changing multiple properties, um, or even just upload an RDF document that contains the, uh, the changes that you wanna make. Uh, and, and you'll see here just the interface will change the URL, uh, the URL at the top to the title if, if a title is available. So I'll flip back over to my slides. Uh, and again, this is just kind of showing you where you would, uh, where you would see that. Um, so uh, on slide 32, this is where we're just gonna do the last uh, CRUD operation. And the, this is the, the delete operation. Um, deleting is uh, permanent if you do it through this uh, HTML interface or through the REST API. Most frameworks like Islandora or Samvera that are built on top of Fedora usually would have some kind of a, a step in between the sort of, you know, are you sure you want to delete this resource? Um, but since we're just kind of issuing a delete command directly to the API here, it's, uh, uh, it just does what we tell it to do. So, I'm going to navigate back down to andromeda.jpg. So here I'm at uh, Andromeda Galaxy, um, and I'm going to click over to andromeda.jpg, uh, and you can see that in the list of children, uh, so it makes it fairly easy to, to get there. Um, 
Uh, there was just a question about uh, whether Fedora supports soft deletes. Uh, not through the API. Um, that would largely be something that, uh, again, uh, Islandora or Sambera or any sort of client that you build on top of Fedora could uh, add support for soft deletes, being able to recover that you know, deleted item or something like that. Uh, if you delete something through Fedora, through the API or through the H HTML interface, um, it gets marked as deleted and then there's a Java operation that periodically uh, cleans that up and, and gets rid of it. So if you delete it through the API, it, it probably won't immediately disappear from your file system, but once the garbage collection runs, it'll, it'll be gone. So it's not really a soft delete, but um, yeah, if you wanted that functionality, that would mostly be sort of the client code on, on top of Fedora that could give you, uh, give you that. And I, and I think most of them do. So here uh, I'm going to uh, go all the way down there to the big red uh, delete button. And again, I'm on andromeda.jpg. Um, and if I hit delete, uh, it basically will just take me back to the parent resource because uh, the, the one I deleted is, uh, is gone now. Um, but if you hit the back button in your browser, you can go back to this andromeda.jpg uh, and, and it's just caching this display. So if you refresh the page, uh, and I'll, I'll increase the font size here. So hopefully you can see it a little bit easier. Um, if you delete a resource through the API, uh, what gets left behind is something that we, we just call a tombstone. Um, and all this is, is, is just a, a basically an HTTP response code that um, lets the uh, user or machine know that um, something used to be here, but it isn't here anymore. And the reason we do that is because at least in production, it's really not a good practice to reuse um, URIs. If you, if you publish a URI to a resource, someone might cite that URI or link to it. And then if you were to delete that resource and put something else in its place, you've essentially changed you know, the, uh, the meaning of that, uh, that URI and, and, and you know, disrupted those, those links. So um, this isn't uh, required if you were in development, for example, and you were just creating and deleting a bunch of resources. You, you can actually, uh, issue a, a command to the API to delete the tombstone as well, and that's documented in the in the API documentation. But um, if you don't, then it just leaves that there, and, and then that's helpful to users and machines if they try to find something that you've deleted to let them know that it uh, it's not that it never existed. Um, there did used to be a resource here, but it's uh, it's gone now, and this is when it was deleted. Uh, and you can just hit your back button or whatever you want to hit to sort of uh, get back to your repository. Um, and, and again, this is just, there are some slides here that just sort of explain in a little bit more detail um, what's going on. So uh, that's really all I wanted to say about the CRUD stuff, the resource management. And again, feel free to uh, drop questions into the, the Q&A or the chat. I'll, I'll try to keep monitoring those. Um, but the, the next thing I'd like to cover here uh, is versioning. So this is another feature that Fedora supports. Um, and uh, we're gonna do hands-on for this as well. So I'll, I'll just stay in this, um, the, this mode for, uh, for now, just to, to make it a little bit easier. Um, but uh, uh, versions are essentially created on demand uh, using the REST API. So it's, it's not automatic, um, uh, although the next version of Fedora you can, uh, will support just automatic versioning if that's what you want. Um, but you can u issue a, a REST API command to create a version uh, basically whenever you want. And um, whenever you retrieve a version that's being done um, in accordance with the Memento protocol. And, and um, if you look up Memento, it's its, a, it's, its own separate protocol. It's used by the Internet Archive uh, along with a number of other um, organizations. And uh, uh, it really just provides a standards-based way to retrieve um, a version. Uh, you can specify a date and time, and the server will respond with a version as near as possible to the date and time that you uh, specify. So uh, just stepping back briefly, in the, the Fedora context, a version is itself a resource. So it has a URI. You can link to it. And it's just a snapshot. It contains the contents of a resource at a particular point in time. Uh, and it's immutable. So if you uh, create a snapshot of a resource in Fedora, or you create a version, you can continue to edit the original resource, but the version itself is, is uh, it's immutable. You can't change it. You can delete it or you can restore it, uh, but you can't change it after you make a version. 
Uh, it has a date down to the second, and that comes from the Memento uh, protocol. Um, it is discoverable, so you can um, you can query a resource and just ask, you know, does this resource have any versions? And Fedora will respond back and, and tell you if it does and what those versions are. Um, and it is there's a separate versioning API that we use to to create versions. So again, this is just a link to the Memento specification, and there's lots that we could say here, um, but I'll, I'll uh, be brief um, that, you know, really this is just kind of a, a standardized way to uh, request resources from servers, uh, versions from servers in a, in a time-based way. Uh, and it has a few core concepts here that are uh, useful to note. Um, the, the term Memento is, is basically synonymous with the way that we would use the word version. So when you create a version in Fedora, that is, is also a memento for the purposes of the spec. It is just the kind of version body of that resource. Um, and it uses this sort of time gate, time map uh, terminology. So, you know, a time gate is, is just, that's the end point where you can make these time-based queries to get mementos back. And uh, time map is the actual list of those mementos. Um, and of course is the original resource, which is the resource that, um, that was uh, uh, versioned. Um, uh, and there's a, uh, just a question, is a version of a binary the snapshot of the metadata only, or does it take the version of the content itself? Uh, it, it, so it, it does version the, uh, uh, the content as well. So if, if you were to do a, um, take a version of a, of a binary resource, it's, um, it, yeah, it does um, version the, uh, uh, the binary file as well, not, not just the metadata. Um, so here we can do, a, again, a little bit more hands-on just to um, uh, see how versioning works. Um, and, and I'm just kind of calling back to some of the stuff that we already did here. I'm, I'm going to create a new version, or sorry, a new resource in Fedora, a new container. Um, and I'm going to call this one uh, map, and I'm going to put it inside the image collection uh, resource. And you can actually version really whatever you want, but um, this is just sort of helpful as, a, uh, as an exercise. Um, so here I'm at the Andromeda Galaxy uh, container and I can see image collection sits above it in the hierarchy. Uh, so I'm gonna click on image collection. Um, and then here uh, I'm gonna go down uh, to where it says uh, basic container and give a, a new identifier here and, and just call it map. So just a very simple map. Um, and uh, this is just intended to be a new container inside the image collection, which we're, we're going to use for purposes of um, experimenting with versioning a little bit. Um, so I'm going to hit the add button. And what you should end up with is uh, uh, slash rest slash image collection slash map. Um, and so far, we haven't made any changes there. So here, and again, this is just showing you the uh, curl request for creating versions as well. Um, but there is a, a, a visual kind of button for creating versions, um, and we're, we're just going to click on that here. So uh, if you scroll down on this resource, which is true of uh, basically any resource, there is a create version button. Uh, and if you click that, it will create a version. Uh, so it takes you to this FCR versions endpoint, uh, and it gives a list of versions. There's just one. Uh, and they're time-based, so uh, this is just based on the server time. And if you click that resource, uh, you will see it does have uh, its own URI, uh, which is just based on the, the, the date time. Uh, and it will tell you that it is a historic version and can't be modified. So you can delete it uh, and you can restore it, although the restore button isn't in this interface yet, but you could do it on the command line. Uh, but you can't make any changes to the, the version, but you can continue making changes to the original resource, which is just back in the, um, in the breadcrumb trail. So uh, just to demonstrate that, um, I've got a, I'm going to do a quick update here uh, and add a title to this map. I'm going to call it a map of Nova Scotia because that's where I'm sitting right now. Uh, that's where my home is in Halifax. Um, so I'm going to uh, click back uh, in the breadcrumb trail here to the map resource. So I can't modify the version, but I'm going to modify the original resource. Um, and again, just so it's clear here, I'm on slide 42. Um, and this is 
exactly the same kind of DC title operation that we did before. It's just a different, um, uh, we're giving it a different title, but uh, I've just copied those three lines. And you can really call this whatever you want. Uh, I'm gonna go down to the update properties box again on, on the map resource, scroll all the way to the bottom, uh, just and replace these delete insert where statements with um, this uh, uh, DC title uh, map of Nova Scotia and, and then I'll click the update button. Uh, and so that happens the exact same way as it um, uh, did in the past uh, when we when we did the last one so that it has the title up here and, and it has the title um, in the properties. Um, there's a question, uh, will Fedora allow creating new versions of an object even if the new version would be identical or does it do a check between versions, i.e. is this the same version? Um, let's know duplicate data or, or double storage requirements. So in the case of a container resource um, like this, it's not gonna detect it. So you, you could just create keep creating new versions and even if those versions are identical, they'll be different in the sense that they have a different uh, date time and so the URI will be different and, and their created date will be different um, even if the content is exactly the same. So it, it's not going to check for that. Um, it, however, for binary resources, if you create a new version of a binary but the file hasn't changed, Fedora is only gonna store the file once. So this is somewhat similar, I guess, to the question that was asked earlier. And I, I should clarify that if you create a new version of a binary and it actually is a different file, then Fedora will store those separately. But if you just create a new version of a binary, but you don't actually change the, the file itself, um, then that file will, will only be stored once. So you're not gonna get a bunch of duplicates of the same, uh, of the same file in that case. Okay, so I've got this uh, map resource, and then I'm just gonna create another version now that I've made a metadata change. Um, so again, down here, I've got create version. I'm gonna click that. And you can see now I have these two different versions and they have different um, timestamps, uh, which is how you can uh, tell them apart. Uh, and so if I look at the first version that I created, it does not have a title. If I go back to FCR versions and I look at the second version I've created, uh, it does have the title. So just showing that, you know, these versions are snapshots and they reflect just a point in time for that resource. And this is just noting that um, there's a lot more you can do with versioning uh, that we're not going to do in this workshop, but you can create versions with specific dates. Uh, you can get a list of all versions. You can find the closest version to a specific date uh, and, and that's all documented. So if you, if you wanna dive more into versioning, you can go ahead and, and uh, read up more of that in, in, uh, uh, in the documentation. So uh, the, for web access control, um, we don't have time today to, to demo this. It's a little bit more complicated to, uh, uh, to demo. But essentially, uh, this is a World Wide Web Consortium or W3C approach for uh, managing authorization and using linked data. So you actually use RDF triples to specify uh, what users can access what files. And you can use users and groups and you can have policies that apply to groups of resources or individual resources and policies that um, override um, uh, other policies, things like that. So uh, it, it's, uh, it gives you a fair amount of control um, and uh, potentially interoperable with other applications that, that implement uh, uh, the same approach. So uh, there's lots more that we could say about authorization and uh, if there's interest, we can al always do uh, a training session that's more focused on authorization. It does take a little bit longer to kind of set up and, and demonstrate uh, how authorization works, um, but that's what's uh, supported in, uh, in Fedora. And the last thing I'm gonna demo here uh, is uh, uh, fixity. Uh, so, um, and this, I think this is a fairly familiar concept, but related to digital preservation. Um, over time, digital objects can become corrupt, uh, particularly if you're moving them around, but even just sitting on the same hardware, it's possible for um, files to be uh, become corrupted. And so doing a fixity check just uh, verifies that uh, none of the bits have changed and the file is um, the way uh, it was originally uh, uh, added to the repository. 
Uh, and so Fedora can do two types of fixity uh, on ingest. Uh, if you already know the fixity value of a resource, so if you were moving a file from one system to another, when you put it in Fedora, you can also provide a known checksum and get Fedora to calculate the checksum of the file and compare it to the known value and tell you if there's a mismatch there. Um, or if you don't know it, that's fine. Fedora will still calculate it on ingest and just store the, the calculated value uh, as property. Uh, and then on demand, you can ask Fedora to uh, recalculate uh, the fixity for any resource and then compare it uh, with the stored value and make sure that nothing has changed. Um, I know there's interest. This is kind of a done at a one at a time um, API call. Um, it, it, there's been some interest uh, from folks in the community, especially for the next version of Fedora to um, uh, you know, take a look at being able to run uh, an operation that calculates fixity sort of across the repository or across a, a, a subset of, of resources in the repository. And um, we haven't uh, built anything in there yet, but uh, I think certainly if that's of interest, uh, you know, stay tuned to the uh, mailing list and we'll probably have more to say about that. Um, and this is just noting that fixity checks are uh, really just a check. So uh, it won't automatically repair that file for you. Um, but if you have uh, earlier versions of a file or if you uh, have backups of that file, you can have an operation that would um, restore uh, a, a working version of, uh, of the file. Um, it also only applies to content managed within Fedora. So Fedora does allow you to store stuff externally and just point to it. But in that case, it won't be able to calculate the fixity. Um, and we support a, a, a few different algorithms, uh, SHA-1, SHA-256, and MP5 right now. So I'm going to do a quick demo here. Uh, and uh, here I'm going to go. You, you can download this, this uh, file, uh, parade.jpg, or you can upload any file that you want. Um, and I'm, I've already down, uh, downloaded that file, and then I'm going to go to um, the image collection uh, and add, uh, uh, add this uh, parade.jpg file inside the image collection container. So I'm going to follow my uh, breadcrumb trail, go back to image collection. And this time I'm going to add a binary. I'm going to call this one parade.jpg. Again, you can upload any file you want, um, but that parade one is just uh, provided for you in case you don't have something laying around. I've got it saved here. And I'll click the add button. And much like the last time, same kind of interface. Um, and here all I'm just demonstrating is this uh, uh, fixity button here. If, if you click that, then you will see that it uh, it does a calculation. It reports success, meaning that the uh, the recalculated uh, checksum uh, here matched the, uh, the stored value. In this case, it was a SHA-1 uh, checksum and the size matched. Um, Sometimes when we do these demos live, we'll go in and sort of manually corrupt the file by editing it in the file system just to demonstrate what happens if fixity fails. But just for the purposes of time uh, here, I think we'll we'll skip that step. But um, it, it, you can verify that uh, um, the, that if, uh, uh, if if the checksum doesn't match, then it, it will report that. Okay, I'm just going to flip back to my main slide deck here because that's sort of the um, the end of, of some of the demo portion stuff. So it'd be a little bit easier to share these slides. Uh, let me just catch up to where I was. Okay, great. Um, oh, and it looks like uh, Danny Bernstein is uh, uh, here as well. I know he wasn't able to join at the very beginning of the call, but um, uh, Danny's just here to help uh, if, uh, if we have some questions that he, he might be, uh, be able to answer. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for coming, Danny. Um, so uh, uh, the conclusion here really is just that um, Fixie is just part of the set of uh, preservation tooling that Fedora supports. Um, uh, for the purposes of, of long-term preservation and uh, uh, endurability of your, uh, of your repository resources. Uh, so the last feature I wanted to talk about here, um, and then I have some stuff on the, the next version of Fedora, um, is just messaging and, and this is sort of, uh, all the other features are API features, so they're things that you use to 
uh, interact with Fedora API directly. Uh, messaging is a bit different. Um, it's really more uh, about asynchronous integration. So um, basically anytime you change anything in the repository, create something, update something or delete something, Fedora sends a, a message out. And so these messages are always being sent out after the event has occurred, which is why we talk about it as asynchronous. It's not at the same time. Messages are always um, about something that happened in the past, although usually it's the very recent past. Uh, and these just get sent out all the time. And if nothing is listening for those messages, then no, nothing happens. But um, it's possible to set up some um, external services and, and uh, uh, use message-based uh, integrations to um, build uh, interesting systems around your repository. And so these services can listen for messages from Fedora and, you know, different services can get triggered depending on the message. Um, and so it, it's possible to use this to build out fairly scalable and fault tolerant systems to do things like kick off workflows um, or uh, index to external uh, search and, uh, and triple store applications. Um, We've gotten a lot of use out of Apache Camel as an integration framework for this. Um, and we have a lot of tooling already if it's something you want to explore, uh, but you can also set up your own systems to do this. So just some common use cases, uh, certainly indexing I had mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a, an external, you can set up an external index. Uh, so say a solar or an Elasticsearch um, uh, endpoint and then um, just index all of your Fedora content there for, for search. So that, that's a fairly common pattern. Uh, and the same with the triple store. So if you want to do sort of complex uh, RDF queries, you can index everything to an external triple store using this message-based pattern. Um, and these, uh, uh, you can use really any application that you want. So the, the, the sort of the nice thing here is you're not restricted to a particular search application or a particular triple store. You can set up whatever you want. And in the future, if a better one comes along, you can always just stand up the new one and index to that and then safely get rid of the old one because it's it's really just an index all of the uh, the kind of canonical source of your data is uh, still in fedora and so this is sort of just to try to pull some of these concepts together this is just an animated slide that that kind of tries to visualize the way that we see fedora in terms of its role in an ecosystem so if you think of fedora you know this this kind of cylinder here that contains these containers represented by RDF and these binary files. Uh, and just noting that binaries can also be stored externally and pointed to. Uh, and then you just have these two kind of integration patterns. You have this uh, API, which is where the CRUD operations and versioning and, and fixity and authorization, all of that happens through the API. Uh, and then the little kind of Wi-Fi symbol at the top is meant to indicate uh, messaging. And so, you know, if you had something like a, a search index, like solar that could be set up externally, then that would sort of use that message base integration pattern. Whereas if you have like a website, uh, which is one of the things that Islandora and Samvera provide, or if you had like a triple IF image server, um, or if you were, you know, had workflow tools, et cetera, lots of options here. These all kind of interact at the level of the uh, API. Uh, and so too with importing and exporting. So typically when you're putting content into Fedora, getting it out of Fedora, that's, that's uh, typically that is going through the API. So, so this is just kind of trying to visualize the role that Fedora plays in a fairly abstract way within an ecosystem of uh, applications and services. And those two different integration patterns, the, the API and the, uh, um, and the message framework. So I want to, and we're, we're just kind of wrapping up here. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about the uh, next version of Fedora. Um, so basically, what are we doing this year? What's, what's coming up? Um, and, and then there's some time at the end here for questions if folks uh, have any that they uh, want, to, want to ask. So uh, our 2020 roadmap, and we're halfway through the year already, of course, but um, we are working on Fedora uh, 6.0. And I should just mention here the with regard to the version numbers, um, the version, th those of you that are familiar with Fedora 3, the jump from three to four was uh, a very big jump, a totally rewritten application. Um, the move from four to five was relatively minor, some small API changes, uh, but we just adopted semantic versioning as a practice. So the version numbers just increment a little bit faster now. Uh, and the move from five to six is similarly um, not as big of a change, uh, some underlying application differences, but um, 
no major API changes um, or, or few changes. Uh, but our plan is to get to a beta release of version 6.0 this year uh, and alongside that to release some updated migration tooling uh, just recognizing that uh, many uh, folks in the community are still on an earlier version particularly version 3 and have been unable to move forward and, and we really want to address that and, and make sure that we have updated tooling um, and all along the way here we're testing the application and validating it uh, with the community and uh, that can serve as a, a bit of an invitation um, if you have Fedora 3 data in particular, or if you're uh, new to Fedora and just want to test the, the new application environment. Um, all that stuff is available and we can point you to that uh, if you're interested in, in doing some testing. So just in terms of kind of our high level goals for this next version of Fedora, um, there's, there's primarily three uh, the first, again, is trying to reduce the effort required to migrate, again, recognizing that much of the community has been on an earlier version for some time. And we uh, did a grant-supported effort. Um, uh, the IMLS funded our uh, designing and migration path work last year, uh, just trying to understand what the barriers to migration uh, were and are. And largely, it has to do with um, the effort required to migrate, as well as um, the, the sort of perception that, that Fedora 4 and 5 didn't offer enough new features to really make that effort uh, worthwhile. And so uh, along with sort of, uh, and so that, that's how these goals kind of relate. We're, we're really trying to both reduce the effort, but also increase the value. And, and that we're largely doing by focusing on the digital preservation features and really trying to uh, enhance those. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but just in ways that um, make it uh, more of an appealing upgrade. Um, and uh, version 4 and 5 have had um, a number of fairly well-documented performance and scale issues that in particular circumstances, um, is, so these don't affect all users, but um, they have affected some users. And uh, we're uh, aware of, of some of those issues. And, and uh, one of the things we're doing with Fedora 6 is addressing some of those uh, performance and scale issues that have cropped up under um, particular, uh, particular uh, instances. Um, and um, so there's a question here, and, and uh, Danny, this might be an opportunity if you want to say anything here. Um, there's a question, uh, does Fedora 6 have any big differences from Fedora 5 as far as using the API? Um, and uh, I, there are not major changes to the existing services, but we are adding a search API, which is a little bit different. Um, so I don't know, Danny, if you wanted to, to uh, say anything um, about uh, anticipated API changes between five and six. Hold on. You didn't hear? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, no, uh, I think as you mentioned, there's the search API, which is which is essentially a very a very simple um, search facility that's that's not intended. To to be something as full featured as like a a um, solar index that would give you um, you know sort of like a much broader range of features but something that gives you visibility into your repository something that's very quick allows you to see all your um, uh, all the uh, sort of objects and to search by things like mind type and uh, size and um, do some basic querying of, of um, fundamental relationships, uh, for example, like containment and ancestry and that sort of thing, um, as well as doing like wildcard searches on PID IDs and, and uh, checksums and that sort of thing. Um, as far as API changes, I think there, there really aren't um, significant uh, sort of changes like but there are there are in, in terms of like existing features that are there I think will largely remain um, untouched and then there will be some new features um, like search and also um, features that are related to uh, sort of the underlying OCFL repository which um, you know that will enable you to have some control over your um, how you, some alternative ways of loading content and also ways of sort of re-indexing that content internally. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, I think that that's, that's pretty much it. 
Yeah, thanks, Danny. And and it's something we can always say more about, but I, I think that's a um, pretty good explanation. Um, there's also a question about uh, how storing binaries are different between version five and six. And um, I, I think we can, uh, it probably takes a little bit more time than we have here today to go into the, a lot of the details about that. But um, we are gonna talk about uh, this uh, implementation in version six of uh, the Oxford common file layout, um, which does dictate how files and folders are, are laid out um, in, uh, in storage media. So um, it is going to be a little bit different, although in version four and five uh, binaries are still um, you know, basically stored on a, on a file system. Um, so the structure of how those binaries are stored will will change. But, uh, and I don't know if you wanted to say anything more about that, Danny. I mean, it's hard to go into a ton of the details here, but if, if you wanted to say anything about binary storage differences between uh, five and six. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the main thing, it's gonna be more transparent, essentially, by, by a large margin. Um, and um, yeah, I think, I don't want to derail things too much here, but. Yeah, and, and we can, um, if, if there's interest and in, we, we've done some talks already on sort of Fedora 6 in more detail, but um, we are, uh, one of the topics for trainings in the future will be kind of diving into some of this uh, Oxford Common File layout stuff. And, and that might be of interest for kind of describing in more detail how that stuff works. Um, and you know, I, I, it's related here to the to the process of of kind of what we're in the middle of doing. So, uh, the, the biggest change here is is replacing the current mode shape um, backend for Fedora, which has been uh, was implemented in version four and and, and is also uh, in version five. And you know, mode shape just provided a lot of the repository features that we didn't have to. Uh, build ourselves with a bunch of custom code, uh, you know, doing the the fixity checking and the versioning, um, resource management, etc. Um, but uh, Mode Shape has been uh, the source of some of the performance and scale problems that we've encountered with with Fedora, actually virtually all of them, uh, and just isn't a project that's very actively maintained anymore. So um, one of our goals here, part of the process, is replacing this Mode Shape um, backend with um, a, a different backend that uh, implements this uh, Oxford Common File layout, which um, again, we don't have time to go to into a ton of detail here in, in today's presentation, but um, uh, we've spoken about it elsewhere. Uh, and, and when we send out a follow-up email, we can include um, some links to, to some of those details. Uh, it's its own separate effort. It, it's its own standard um, that provides a lot of, uh, really it's just describing how files and folders should be laid out on your storage media in accordance with the, uh, uh, digital preservation best practices. Um, and that's uh, basically what we're gonna be implementing in version six for kind of the back end uh, of, uh, of Fedora for how things are, are ultimately stored. Um, but as Danny was saying, we're, we're largely retaining alignment with the API other than adding this new search API. Um, the existing services aren't anticipated to uh, change significantly, um, but we are also working on this migration tooling. And, and so there is already a tool that is capable of transforming Fedora 3 content to Fedora 6 content. Uh, you can try that now. Um, before we do a full release, we'll also have tooling that will support moving content from version 4 and version 5, uh, which uh, won't be as heavy of a lift in any case. And, and so um, we anticipate being able to support migrations from uh, all previous versions to, to, version, uh, uh, to version 6. That's certainly one of the goals with this, uh, with this next release. Uh, and just to briefly describe some of the benefits of, of Fedora 6, and I've alluded to some of these already, but you know, as Danny mentioned with this sort of transparent um, you know, way that Fedora will, will uh, store files and, and store metadata, et cetera, um, it really gets us towards this uh, goal of, of being able to kind of fully separate the Fedora application from um, the uh, underlying uh, data store. So you know, for recoveries from disaster scenarios, um, that you'd be able to basically rebuild your entire repository just from the contents on disk. Um, so you don't have to rely on Fedora uh, as an application to interpret that stuff. Um, and, and so both humans and machines will be able to kind of read and to some degree understand what's going on there. Um, and part of this too helps, it makes migrations easier in part because rather than having to uh, ingest everything through an API as is the case in version four and five, um, once you've migrated your data to a format that's compatible with Fedora 6, 
you'll be able to just kind of drop this new application on top of that data and have it read it in and rebuild an index and, and it get going. So it's, it's much faster than uh, having to uh, do a complete migration through, uh, through an API has, as has been the case. Um, but we also anticipate that future versions of Fedora would continue to comply with this standard. And so you just wouldn't need to migrate your data nearly as often in, in the future as, uh, uh, as you had uh, in the past. Um, uh, and I, I do see another question here. What are the advantages of using a Fedora cluster instead of the standalone instance? And does this happen commonly in the use cases that you've seen? And, uh, and I don't know what you want to say about this, Danny. I know that clustering has been explored in the past, but it hasn't been something that has been widely used. Um, and I, I'm not aware of Fedora instances currently um, that are doing very much with clustering. Um, but I'm not sure if this has come up in the context of Fedora 6 yet either. Yeah, um, I, I think there's um, for the, I, I think for our initial uh, 6.0 beta, um, I, we are not targeting a clusterable Fedora, um, but I believe that is sort of on the agenda for sort of, you know, sort of the near term releases after that. So I think that that's definitely something on our radar. We are, um, we are going to support um, integration with with S3. So the way that's going to work is basically in the underlying OCFL layer, there will be um, a, a switch that essentially allows you to store your content on S3. Um, that that uh, project is in process right now. It hasn't been tested extensively because we're focused on the score functionality, but um, we do have um, there's uh, one main developer who's working on the S3 piece as well. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the main thing. Um, yeah, well, thanks, Danny. And, and I, I do think if, if there are folks that are interested in clustering, we'd, we'd certainly like to hear from you. Um, we have a weekly tech call uh, that anyone's welcome to attend, or uh, you can send us an email or jump on the Slack or send get on the mailing list. And I have a link at the end for, for all that stuff. But um, I think there's still certainly time to introduce some of those use cases, um, and, and we definitely like to uh, to hear more about them. Uh, and just to give you a sense of where we're at, so there, there's testable testable code now. You can build the latest version of of the uh, Fedora six uh, code and and run it. Um, the, the migration utility uh, is available and, uh, for testing. Uh, we're running code sprints uh, one week out of, out of every month throughout the year. The next one is in July, and, and those are completely open as well, and, and actually a good opportunity if you're less experienced with Fedora to um, kind of uh, get an opportunity to uh, skill up a little bit on on um, uh, working on it. And and you know, there's a good team uh, of uh, of uh, developers that'd be happy to kind of uh, help you learn uh, uh, learn the ropes. Um, and uh, we do anticipate uh, a, a beta release sometime later this year. Um, and then that would be followed by a period of, of testing and validation before we released a full uh, Fedora 6 release, which uh, quite likely would be early next year. And just finally, just to say a thank you to um, all of the institutions that uh, support us. As I was saying earlier, this is a community supported program uh, and we really just wouldn't be able to do this work and uh, keep going without all the institutions that support us, uh, both financially, which is what we're showing here, but also uh, in kind through contributions to the developer team and to testing and validation and all of those things. So uh, certainly want to say thank you to all of those uh, institutions that support us. Um, and if you're a Fedora user and you're not yet a, a supporter, I'd, I'd really urge you to consider uh, becoming a member, um, particularly in this uh, uh, in this environment. It's it's uh, more important than ever to try to support these uh, uh, these programs and, and uh, so that we can try to uh, weather the uh, difficult financial circumstances. So I have a few uh, links here, but um, that's largely the end of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'm going to send these slides out. Uh, well, I've already given you the link, so you have those, but we'll send out a survey um, and the recording of this, uh, this presentation. So if you want to go back or share it with colleagues, um, you'll be able to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there and, and we have um, maybe 10 minutes or so uh, in case anyone has any questions or comments that they haven't had an opportunity to uh, uh, 
to uh, a post yet. Um, so feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, and we'll, we'll just give it a minute or two and, and um, uh, try to answer any questions that come through before we uh, close things down. Okay, uh, thanks for the comment, uh, Jennifer. Glad you found it useful. Um, yeah, and, and for anyone that's interested in migration, um, do feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we're always happy to help provide some guidance there. We have had some community members already uh, testing some of the migration stuff, particularly from version uh, Fedora 3 to Fedora 6. And um, it, it, you may need a little bit of guidance to uh, get everything working properly. So do feel free to reach out. We're always uh, happy to help out. Uh, getting community input on these things is really important. We want to make sure that whatever we release uh, meets the the needs of the community and the, you know before we kind of uh, put it out there. So um, early testing and validation is is really important. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions, but uh, feel free to put them in. If I happen to see a question before we shut things down here, I'll, uh, I'll be sure to answer it. Um, but if not, I, I do want to say thanks to everyone for uh, attending this. Um, uh, it was great to be able to convert some of these um, uh, training materials to an online format. Um, and again, do let us know what we can do to improve and what other topics would be useful. Uh, I think we're just very interested in moving as much of this training online as possible and expanding it uh, and, and making it a, a resource for um, for the community. Uh, so uh, so thank you, uh, and, and we'll follow up with uh, with a, a recording and a survey and uh, and some other details.